All right, so ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome. I am Zdeněk Hanzalek, and I thank you for watching the 20th installment of the scheduling seminar. Uh, let me ask Mike Pilendo to introduce the speaker. Okay, let me introduce John Fowler. He is the Motorola Professor of International Business at ASU at Arizona State University. And he has a very high profile because he was uh, editor-in-chief of IIE transactions in healthcare system. Now he is the editor of the Journal of Simulation. <coughs> and he has a wide experience in scheduling in the semiconductor industry with, with companies like Intel and that type. Uh, this will be the first of two talks. So two weeks from now, we have also Lars Mung. He will continue basically this scheduling and semiconductor manufacturing. Okay, let uh, John, please start. Thanks, Mike. I, I really appreciate it. So I'm honored to be here. Um, not many good things have come out of COVID, but I think this seminar series is, is one good thing that, uh, that has come out of COVID. So it's great to get the community together. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about some uh, scheduling problems in, in semiconductor manufacturing. And so uh, as Mike indicated, it's really a two-part talk. Uh, I'm gonna give the first part and Lars Munch is gonna give the second part. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit about motivating the semiconductor manufacturing uh, problem. It's an interesting scheduling problem. I'll talk a little bit about describing what is the environment, the semiconductor environment, the process, and then some scheduling problems that exist within that. Uh, but at a very high level, just sort of introduce what the, the problem areas are. And then I'll talk a little bit more in detail about some work that we've done in the past on, on factory scheduling. Then Lars will come back next week and talk more about things at the machine level or the work center level, where he'll talk about some batch scheduling problems, which are really quite fascinating, uh, and a couple of others. And then he'll conclude and give some uh, future challenges. So, uh, you know, Semiconductor manufacturing is interesting for one thing because, you know, semiconductors are ubiquitous. They're, they're pretty much in every device that we, that we uh, can think of, right? Uh, so the electronics has, you know, advanced tremendously. What's happened is it's always been a complex uh, manufacturing process. It's gotten even more complex as we have to get the chips smaller and faster and uh, requiring less power going forward. So this just shows a little bit of the progression of you know, what chips have been used for, all kinds of other things as well. And some of you may be aware that right now there's a chip shortage, right? So it's really a time where scheduling really could play a major role for, for the semiconductor companies to be able to make the right products to, to meet the, the demand. So it turns out it's a, a large industry, uh, almost half a trillion dollars, a little over half a trillion dollars in 2021. Um, so what's happened is the, uh, the industry is actually, uh, the chip shortage started primarily in the automotive industry, but, and it happened because of uh, downturn in demand for automobiles and then a large increase, but very much a large increase in uh, personal computing uh, as people started working home much more. So there are several different models. Um, traditionally, there was just the one that's on the top here, which is a company that designs the product and then manufactures it both in the front end and the back end. That's an uh, integrated device manufacturer. That would be like an Intel making their, their own computer chips. But uh, 20, a little more than 20 years ago now, um, started with um, a model down here where you have companies that do nothing but design their products. Uh, Qualcomm, and then they have someone else manufacture them. So they do a fabulous design. And then they have foundries like TSMC, which is now the largest semiconductor manufacturer, uh, who doesn't make their own products. They make products for others, all right? And have gotten really good at, at the manufacturing process. And then there's these back-end operations, which I'll talk more about in a moment, that, that also do some outsourcing. And of course, some of these companies, some of these integrated device manufacturers, uh, also do some of their work in foundries and outsource some of their assembly and test. It's interesting that the model is also changing a little bit uh, in that Intel has recently announced that they are also going to make chips for others with, with the other people's designs. So they're gonna get into this foundry business as well. 
So about 70% of the um, semiconductor chips that are designed are down in this space, okay, with fabulous companies. Uh, and about 70% is up here. I may have said that wrong. 30% is, is outsourced to foundries. So, you know, it's really complicated to, to make these uh, computer chips. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And so TSMC is going to build a new fab, thankfully, for us in Arizona. Um, and it's going to cost about $12 billion. And it's going to take over two years to bring that uh, facility online. So it's, it's a non-trivial problem there. Uh, so the, the scheduling problems in semiconductor manufacturing is really a rich environment for, you know, for studying and scheduling. Uh, it's been, there's been quite a bit of uh, work done in this area by both researchers and practitioners over the last three decades, okay? And some of the causes of that are high degrees of automation that have been around for quite some time. You know, semiconductor fabs, um, when I got started in the business about, gosh, 35 years ago, I guess, um, they, I started very young, by the way. Um, they auto, already had a lot of automated real-time data collection. You know? So they were already collecting a lot of data uh, unfortunately, they didn't know many manufacturing practices. The, the factories were run primarily by process engineers or chemical engineers, uh, electrical engineers. And so, uh, you know, a lot of work has gone on to bring them into uh, current manufacturing processes. Um, and so increased automation pressure is the automated material handling systems. In fact, in fabs today, uh, there are no operators around running moving parts between machines, all right? All that has an AMHS system that moves, moves everything inside the factory. The only time a person goes in the factory is actually to repair equipment. So scheduling pro, uh, approaches are both promising and necessary in this domain. And the current state of the art in this is really sophisticated dispatching rules are still used by a lot of companies. And other companies are looking at um, trying to optimize one area. Uh, and one of the common areas is a It's where the most expensive equipment is. They will try to run an optimization model to schedule that area. And then pretty much hope that that uh, takes care of everything else. Right. So a little bit more about the, the process. Again, you know, what a semiconductor chip is, is really highly miniaturized integrated uh, electronic circuits, and it's got thousands of components. Uh, it starts out as a raw silicon wafer over here on the left-hand side, all right? And usually silicon, gallium arsenide, and some other materials are, are currently being used, but that's the majority is still silicon, uh, which basically is sand, all right? Um, there's up to a, a thousand identical chips can be made on each wafer. I've actually seen numbers higher than that, uh, three or 4,000. So you're making a bunch of devices on one chip, and then uh, they're built up layer by layer in what we call a wafer fab, a wafer fabrication facility, a wafer fab for short. And then they're sent to probe where you, you, uh, you probe down into each of the individual die to see, are they good? You mark the ones that are good and, uh, or mark the ones that are bad. And then when you get sent to the back end, which I'll talk about in a moment, you're able to pick off the ones that are good and put them in into a package so that it can be put into a cell phone or to a computer, et cetera, okay? So together, this wafer fab and probe, we call the front end. These often, they generally are not done in exactly the same facility, though they may be co-located. And then they're sent to uh, a place to be assembled, all right? And by assemble, that means put into this package uh, and then the packets are sent to final test uh, where they're tested before they're sent to, to the end customer. And so we call this the back end assembly and test. We're mainly going to talk in this about things that are being done on the, at the wafer fab level. And, uh, but there's really interesting scheduling problems in, in the back end as well. So in terms of the processors, a typical fab has many process flows. Uh, someone like TSMC has you know, thousands of process flows going on all the time. Um, and, but, and maybe a company that's making just memory products has fewer, but they still will have multiple flows going on, maybe different generations of products. 
Uh, each process flow can contain 1,200, maybe even more steps all right, that it has to go through. And uh, there'll be 700, several hundred machines that they go through. Those are very expensive machines. You know, a state of the, of the art lithography machine costs about 150 million US dollars. So you don't just buy an extra one and solve your, your scheduling problem by just adding a bunch of capacity. And so you have to efficiently use those resources. Any, any time lost on a machine like that is really expensive, assuming that you can sell what you're making. Um, and so there's great uh, emphasis on lithography. It tends to be the bottleneck because of that reason, because of the high cost. But other equipment can be quite expensive also. So generally, there's in a work center, there's unrelated parallel machines. Um, one of the things that complicates things, I think, from a scheduling point of view is this reentrant flow. The idea is, if you see down below, that you start out with making a product, and then you go through various steps, and it continues to circulate through these steps. And each time it goes through one of these uh, circuits, we, we call that a layer. All right, so you're building up layer by layer um, the product, and then it finally gets out. And so that makes scheduling uh, particularly challenging. I think the fact that you've got these extra, uh, you've got things that you that you make at one step, it will come back eventually to the same machine, at least in most cases. And there can be radically different processing times on, on different uh, parts. And that processing time can be wafer-based. So that's the individual wafer. They, they move together. And I'll talk more about this in a moment, but they move together in groups. And then we call that a lot. And so some of the times are, it's the same time for the entire lot. Others, it depends on the number of wafers in the lot. And there's some that are batch where we put multiple lots together to be uh, you know, processed simultaneously. So the long operations often uh, involve these batch operations and the nonlinear flow, because you mix these batching and non-batching machines, uh, adds a lot of variability in the system. And as most of us know, um, variability will ultimately lead to long queues, particularly if you have utilizations that are, that are non-trivial. There's also these nested time constraints for the processing of jobs uh, that try to prevent native oxidation and contamination effects on the wafer surface. So one step completes, and I'll talk more about these in a moment, there's several different ways. You have to get it through the next step by a certain amount of time, or you have a violation and you have to redo it. All those uh, time constraints are set by the process engineers who have found over time that you know if you exceed those time limits, that they, the product doesn't yield very well. And I will say that the, over the, the, the life of the industry, process yield has been sort of the key driver, uh, even more so than really uh, what, what I would think of as an industrial engineer, a, a productivity measure, or an operations management person, a, a productivity. Um, and so, you know, to get a very small percentage increase in yield, they're willing to sacrifice um, some throughput. I think that's starting to change uh, as they realize there is some, some diminishing returns there. Uh, then there's uh, also a lot of machine failures, particularly if they're on the leading edge, uh, making leading edge products, the ones that are now very small. The, the problem has been that the industry has just continually gotten smaller and smaller. Uh, and so they never, the, it's been difficult to make machines really highly reliable because they're always on the bleeding edge of pushing that machine out to the next, uh, to the next level in terms of uh, making it smaller and, and faster. So some machines like the implanters have really significant uh, sequence dependent setup times. Those can be, you know, multiple hours, some maybe even as much as uh, 24 hours to do a setup from one, it's called a species. It's what's it's implanted into the wafer. Uh, there's dynamic uh, bottlenecks depending on the product mix. You change the product mix and, and the, certainly move around. Uh, there are processing steps that require auxiliaries, you know, such as in photolithography, the reticles, which is what actually sets the pattern on the wafer that uh, defines the circuitry. Those require reticles. Reticles are fairly expensive to, to make. So that's usually a limited resource. Um, and 
And so that complicates things. And then these wafers, as I indicated, are transported in what are called FOOPs or front opening unified pods. There's a, a picture of one here. Typically 25, most of the FOOPs will carry 25. There's some that will over 12, uh, but, and then these move around. And the part of the reason for this is that this is a closed environment. And so when they're in these FOOPs, they can't be, the contamination is, is uh, reduced greatly by having to move around in these FOOPs. And so those get moved around. While this shows a person moving a FOOP, generally, as I said, that's not gonna be the case. It's gonna be moved by the automated material handling system. So this manufacturing environment is different in several ways from sort of traditional uh, flow and job shops. So some of the scheduling problems that are of interest um, are batch scheduling problems, all right? So batches are groups of jobs that have to be processed together simultaneously. And so uh, in the process together, the, the completion time ends up being uh, of the batch is the completion time of the last job in the batch. You know, in general, when we talk about uh, batching problems, we talk about serial batching and parallel batching. So S batching is the processing time of the batches, the sum of the processing times of all the jobs. So that might be, uh, that's appropriate for cases like where you have setups uh, and you do one setup, but each job can move on to the next step after it's done uh, processing. And then there's parallel batching where the processing time of the batch is the maximum processing time of the jobs that form the batch. Uh, in wafer fabrication in particular, this P batching is, is very important uh, and drives a lot of the, the variability that happens in the system is um, because if when you have a batch, you're waiting to form the batch that causes extra time. And then when the batch completes, multiple lots are sent to the next workstation. So it makes the flow very thirsty. Um, and uh, again, that variability has negative consequences on the, on the performance of the system. So with an assumption of a fixed batch size B, we can look at uh, burn-in ovens and that's on the back end. Okay, when we're doing testing, we're testing chips, the, put them in a burn-in oven and you heat them and stress test them to find out which ones would fail early on in the process. Uh, but in wafer fabrication, the diffusion furnaces are the big area where you have batching. So we have what we call incompatible job families there. All right, that is that jobs have to be of the same family to be batched together because the, the chemical nature of the process and the whole recipe associated with the amount of time that you have it in the furnace, et cetera, is very critical. So you can't take multiple steps and put them together. Uh, early on in the process for some, uh, some different products, we'll be able to, you can batch them together in those early steps because you're building up some of the primary layers that may be common to many different uh, parts where you customize them later in the process, okay? Um, and in some cases, you need secondary resources, even for the batching machines. So here's an example of one in semiconductor manufacturing. We have what we call uh, three, what we call incompatible job families. You can have four. All right. And so you've got lots of these different families that all get put together. And so here, this is family B is being processed in this furnace and family A is processed in this furnace. And there's not always, it's not always the right thing to make a full batch, which is one of the things that makes scheduling the batch processing uh, difficult. And depending on the performance metrics that you're interested in, many times it's, it's best to not run a full batch. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, that just complicates the, the scheduling problems. And Lars is gonna talk next week uh, quite a bit about this. We just recently, had a paper published in EJOR that really reviews the literature, and there's about 300 papers on this batch scheduling problems that are of interest, and we probably could have added more. Another thing that really complicates uh, scheduling in semiconductor manufacturing, and, and the one area that I would say is not, maybe not particularly well addressed, at least from the factory level, is there are these cluster tools. So this over on the, the right-hand side, you see a picture here of a cluster tool uh, where you have a robot, maybe multiple robot uh, handling arms in the center that will take wafers that come in over on this side. They'll be put in a load port here, 
And then they're loaded into, as needed, they're loaded into these ports where you'll have the incoming wafers here. Wafers will come out of the, the actual load port, go here and wait to get processed on these machines. And there can be a completely different pass on these machines. There's also a lot of work that has to be done to avoid uh, getting a deadlock on these machines where you've got you know, no place to put a wafer, uh, et cetera. So what typically happens is th this is a whole group of, a fairly small group, but a group of researchers that are looking at scheduling these cluster tools. Mostly this is, they use an optimization models to build this. One of the challenges going forward, I think, is how do I characterize that information so that when I put the in a factory model, I don't have to have all the detail and run that, that complete um, schedule, uh, that complete optimization model each time that I want to schedule the tool for just a very small number of lots. Obviously, one of the other issues is what order do I put the lots in even in front of this machine, all right? Uh, also, I should point out that failures can happen on any one of these, what we call chambers, this A, B, C, and D up here, the chambers. And sometimes that will make it where you, um, you can't process through the machine. In other cases, it simply reduces the throughput capability of the machine. So in some cases, there's um, parallel chambers that do the same thing. In other cases, it's more of a serial process to those steps. I mentioned this before, the time constraints can take on many different forms, uh, actually in, in the wafer fab. So the first one is that, uh, you know, I've got a, a part that starts on machine group one. It has to start on machine group two by some elapsed time. Uh, you have a case where there, in, in this, the first case, there's no machines in between. Here, there, it goes to a separate machine group, but it still has to reach this uh, four, uh, within a certain amount of time. You can also have them uh, sequential. So we've got, in this case, you've got a, a time window here uh, and another followed by another time window. There also can be overlapping time windows, right? And so this is a case where we have an overlapping uh, time constraint. This one overlaps with this one. Um, and you can also have embedded time constraints, which is what this last, last constraint is. All right, another interesting problem uh, from, I think from a scheduling point of view is what we call the multiple orders per job problem. So in cases where you have small quantities of parts needed, uh, and this would be probably particularly true for those um, contract manufacturers, like I mentioned, like TSMC. And so they may only need, as I said, you can, they can produce often many, many uh, devices on one wafer. They may only need to fill an order. They may only need, let's say, six six wafers, and another order might only require four wafers, etc. So now the the question becomes, you know, we don't probably won't, don't want to run the foop with just the four wafers. Um, so can we combine those into foops? Again, typically a size twenty five, where we put orders together. All right, so we we form the jobs here. And now we then have to sequence the job. So just another extension on, on, the, on the scheduling problem. And then last uh, that I'm gonna mention now, um, I, I should mention one other thing that, that I don't have a slide for, and that is machine qualifications are also an important uh, thing to factor in when you do scheduling. In some cases, it's very simple. It's like machine eligibility restrictions. Certain machines are qualified to do certain steps and not all machines are qualified to do those steps. In other cases, it's a little bit more nuanced than that because a machine might be qualified, uh, but if you run uh, qualified temporarily and that qualification will run out, unless you run another set of wafers through it of the same type that you can test and see if they're okay. And if that test is okay, then you're able to extend the qualification. So that one's even more tricky where it really depends on the current state. And so there's been some work by, uh, by some researchers on looking at um, how you schedule considering those, make, trying to make sure you keep the machines qualified. Um, and so that's, that's, that's really interesting and challenging work. 
So uh, back in 1997, Ovechek and Utsoy talked about modeling wafer fabs as complex job shops, um, you know, with unrelated parallel machines, sequence pin setups, uh, parallel batch machines, the reentrant flows, and then you would have the ready time of the jobs with the idea being that at some point you would want to put this in a factory and you would have some jobs that were, you know, partially processed and other jobs that wouldn't arrive until they got to uh, through until some time. So they looked at modeling this as a, you know, a flexible job shop with ready times and parallel batching, uh, they, and incompatible because you have to put the families together with uh, setups and recirculating flow and uh, with a weighted tardiness uh, objective, some avoided tardiness. They also looked at that for uh, an LMAX, maximum lightness. And so they, they talked about using the shipping bottleneck, which is based on disjunctive graph uh, formulation to solve those. I'm gonna talk more about disjunctive graph formulations in a moment. Uh, and then large scale job shops, you know, will have several hundred machines, several hundred jobs in diverse uh, production mix. Okay, so that's kind of a review of the overall scheduling process and the, um, and, and some of the interesting, I think, scheduling problems that exist. Uh, each one of those that I talked about easily could have done a full talk on those. I'm just trying to today give you a little bit of an overview of those. So I'm next going to talk about some work we did uh, a while back now, but there was a group of us working on uh, trying to come up with a deterministic scheduling approach for, for work with application facilities. And so again, our goal was to, to do this, develop this deterministic scheduling approach that could handle global scheduling decision, you know, in a real wafer fab and would perform well in uncertainty. So we were interested in not only can we build the deterministic schedule, but what's the impact of, you know, failures, et cetera, on that. And this project was funded under some joint funding by International Semitech uh, and the Semiconductor Research Corporation uh, to, to look at that. And we have what we call the Factory Operations Research Center. The National Science Foundation was involved uh, in an earlier version of, of this program. And so again, we had partners from, from Europe, Lars being one of the partners, um, and uh, those of us at Arizona State and uh, Scott Mason, who was mentioned on the previous slide, was at the University of Arkansas at the time. And he did this early work. Um, he was the one that did the, the early work on this. So this I'm sure is, new, uh, is familiar to almost all of you, but I'm just gonna cover it real quick to, to remind people uh, that, you know, we started thinking about a, a classic job shop, all right? Only one machine at each workstation and the C-Max. Um, and again, so you're, you're sequencing these end jobs on end machines to minimize the make span. Difficult problem. I mean, it's an MP hard problem already. And uh, so again, many of the heuristics applied to that problem based on the disjunctive graph approach. So reminder of what a disjunctive graph is, um, you've got here, you've got three different jobs. So each of these arcs, uh, each of these paths is, is, a, uh, is the sequence of operations. So this is machine two, uh, use, this step uses uh, machine two and it's job one. You know, so you go through that path. The, uh, Darker, the, the solid uh, arcs here are the conjunctive arcs and they indicate the actual present relation between the operations of the same job. The, the idea of the disjunctive arcs is that they will, if we fill these in, we choose which ones we're going to put here, we'll end up um, setting the sequence that you'll process those on the machine. Okay, so again, the shifting bottleneck developed by uh, Adam Wilson-Zalak in 1998, uh, decomposes this problem into multiple instances of the single machine uh, with ready times and LMAX problem. And so the subproblems are solved according to some specified subproblem solution procedure. And then you evaluate those in terms of the performance or the machine criticality. Uh, and then the most critical machine based on that machine criticality measure is scheduled at each other iteration. Uh, and that using that decomposition technique, key sections of the problem are, are, are modeled. So 
I think I probably don't need to cover much on this slide, just the definition of lateness and tardiness here. Um, we were interested actually in the weighted tardiness of, of the jobs. And, you know, uh, Pinedo and Singer had investigated this for a job shop with, with single machines at a workstation in a paper in 1999. And that was kind of a key paper for us to, to take off from. And so we were then looking at a flexible job shop again with uh, ready time, sequence dependent setups, batching and recirculation. The total weight of tardiness is the performance measure. So one of the things that, that we had to do here because of the batching, that was probably the most interesting part of the work was we had to look at different batching combinations here. So uh, what you have here is these, all three of these steps require to be batched together uh, or to be, could be processed as a batch. So we had to consider here with, with steps two, seven, and 11, we had to consider running them each individually, running them in pairs, or running them in a set of three. Uh, this assumed that the, that the uh, machine could handle up to three jobs at a time. So you can see a combinatorial explosion here of possibilities for, uh, for what you might do. And so the first thing was to look at these potential batches that we had. Uh, I, I should point out here that this is um, indicated by uh, Pinedo and Singer that you now, rather than having the one end node, which was set C max, you have essentially an end node for each, uh, for each product being made or each job that's going through the system with its due date so that when they get there, you can measure, measure the due date. Okay, the performance compared to the due date. So you would look here at the potential batches to form. And then once you form the batches, you had the regular uh, scheduling problem. The other thing to, that you had to consider here was the fact that it was because of this potential reentrant flow, you had to make sure you didn't create, you had to be even more careful than usual to make sure you didn't generate a cycle uh, because you had to make sure that the earlier step uh, if you had two steps on the same machine, that the earlier step didn't limit the, uh, didn't, had to get done before the second one. At that time. All right, so then you would end up here with a, with a final schedule. So our heuristic for doing this is we, we let M be the set of all machines, uh, and M not the, those that are, uh, have been sequenced or scheduled. We then looked at all the machines for each of the machines that was not yet scheduled using some kind of sub, uh, sub problem solution procedure. We identified the critical ones using a machine criticality measure. And then we would sequence the tool group um, that was the best, had the best performance on the machine criticality measure. You would then insert that, make those arcs become uh, conjunctive arcs, you know, choose to, to schedule there. And at that point, you could consider uh, re-optimizing the schedule for all those machines that had already been scheduled, considering that new one and deciding whether that was worth doing or not. And then you just simply loop through here to, uh, to do that. All right, so we looked at, um, we had some data sets uh, of real wafer fabs that, that we used to, to help develop the, um, to test the, the algorithm. Uh, and there's a link there. So if you have the slides, you can, uh, you can go there and you can see at that website, which is hosted by uh, Lars Munches uh, at Lars Munches University, there's a, quite a few web uh, factory models. Uh, and now there's actually some supply chain models there where you can get you know, some realistic data for, uh, for fabs and, and the supply chain, okay? So we, anyway, we used the, the first data set out of this, and we, we looked at some uh, common dispatching rules to, to compare it to. And so in, in this early, this very early part, this was the part looking at just the deterministic view of it. We, we took that data set, we took the top 10 bottleneck tools that were expensive tools, and we created a, a modified version of that data set um, and so we had to readjust some of the tools to make it a, a problem that would be interesting. And we did that using a, a simulation package called Factory Explorer, which allowed us to, to determine uh, how many tools we should have 
in order to make the problem uh, challenging and, and interesting. We also included some sequence dependent setups uh, in that for the, the implanters. And so initially we investigated 10 different uh, 20 job instances of that modified data set uh, with random ready times, weights, and due dates associated with it. And so this is the performance that we got of the different, uh, those different dispatching rules and the shifting bottleneck heuristic. Uh, so you take the, the performance of one and divide it by the performance of the best. And so a ratio of one means it's the, it's the best solution. And you can see that in nine out of the 10 here, the shifting bottleneck gave the best performance. In the one case, it didn't. It didn't perform particularly well, but the, you could easily run these dispatching rules quite easily. They don't take very long to, to run. Uh, and so you could then you know, pick that as the best. So that gave us the um, impetus to move on to looking at trying to develop this for something uh, in actual wafer fab. So our overall approach then was to, um, we would start here, we would gather the information on the current lots, tools, the future lots. We get that from our manufacturing execution system, which keeps track of all of that very easily. To, very, it's pretty easy to pull that information out of there. Build the disjunctive graph corresponding to all the information. And we would assume initially all the tools were unscheduled, though that easily could have been relaxed. We construct the, the schedules um, you know, for all the unscheduled tool groups, and we select the, um, we select the most critical tool group based on machine criticality measure. We reevaluate all the tools uh, to see if it makes sense to, to, to readjust them once we put the new machine in. We look and see if all the groups have been scheduled. If the answer is no, we continue to loop through and schedule the others. And then we ultimately, once we schedule all of them, we publish the fixed schedule to the, to the manufacturing execution system. And then that gives guidance to the operators on what they should be doing, uh, what they should be processing next at the different workstations. So uh, fortunately we had uh, some computer science folks on the, on the team. And so they developed this nice framework for us testing it where we had the scheduler that we built and we had a data model there where we could pass information across this message bus to um, a simulation model in a package called ASAP, which is was kind of the standard simulation uh, package at that time for the wafer fabs. And so we, we then put it into that and we let the dispatcher dispatch to the rules that we set up, uh, to the schedule that we set up, you know, down here in the schedule. Part of the reason for doing this was the idea was that if you, we're going to implement this in a real system. This part didn't need to change. You would just need to simply have that. And the, most of the MES systems have linkages already to a dispatcher. So, so that's a, a fairly easy implementation. So uh, we looked at three different fab sizes uh, to, to test out what we had done. All right, so we looked at um, several different dispatching rules here, ODD being the operational due date that we could set by looking at the disjunctive graph, uh, the ATCS rule, the current tardiness cost with setups rule uh, that is you know, geared towards minimizing uh, tardiness, weighted tardiness in that case. Um, and then, so we looked at three fabs, one very small, we only have five tools. This is sort of a, a canonical model of a wafer fab, it's very small. It allows one to, it has sort of all the characteristics of, a, no, not all, most of the characteristics of a wafer fab that are interesting. The second fab was had the, was more similar to what I showed for in that deterministic case, there were 45 tools. And then we took one that had uh, 268 tools, okay, um, in it. And so we looked at a simulated interval of 40 days for the, for that larger factory and 500 days. Um, for the, the smaller factories. We had the bottleneck loaded to about 95%. We set the due dates uh, to be fairly tight. Um, and we, we chose those based on looking at the FIFO dispatching uh, cycle times, okay? And so again, we were interested in the total weight of targets uh, as a measure. So we looked at scheduling intervals of two to 16 hours. So that's how many 
hours am I going to actually build the schedule for? Um, and then an additional horizon. So we're, we're doing this in an environment where we schedule for the, let's say for two hours, all right? And we make, but we may actually schedule it out beyond that with that additional horizon. So we might actually schedule for 18 hours, but only implement two hours. And then two hours later, we would reschedule. Um, so we buried that scheduling interval and then the additional horizon that we looked at, all right? Um, and so we looked at several different sub um, pollution procedures. First in, first out, EDD, critical ratio, the, the operational due dates, uh, a batch ATCS rule, all right? So one that was built on, on trying to form batches that would also perform off the total weight of tardiness. Uh, so it would be the, the BATCS for the batch tools and the ATCS for the regular tools. Uh, we looked at the, the batch tools, ATCS rule and the critical ratio and the batch uh, ATCS rule and operational due dates. And we looked at how many reoptimization steps we would allow and what were the parameters for the BATCS uh, and the ATCS rule. So for the small models, this is um, the, here the total weight of tardiness given in, in seconds. Um, and we set the other parameters to be reasonable values. And so what you have here on the left is you have the shifting bottleneck approach with these different uh, subproblem solution procedures. And over here, the, um, the what performance we got for dispatching. And you can see here that um, the shifting bottleneck here value, actually the best we got was 13.4% of the best dispatching rule, which was dispatching with uh, operational due dates. Likewise, in the second fab, you know, again, we got very much better performance um, than we did with the, uh, with the dispatching rules. Not surprising, we're working harder, we, we should do better. Uh, this shows what happens with different intervals. This is the scheduling interval. This is for a particular rule where we use the total weight of tardiness as the machine criticality measure and the uh, batch um, ATCS with the operational due dates here. This is how long we actually, how often we reschedule. That's the every two hours, every four hours. This is the additional horizon. And these were very small. Um, and you can see that doing short, in both cases actually, doing short intervals and then even short horizons were, was actually uh, led to the best results, all right? So the, the uh, computation time here was actually quite quick. Um, and we looked at automated parameter setting for the BATS rules. That would be you know, rules that would say, based on the, the current instance that you were scheduling, what were the, how you were gonna set those parameters. This was you know, a while back. So the, you know, it was a, just a regular standard desktop computer that we ran it on. And then, so the best total weight part in this case, um, took less than 0.2 seconds per schedule. And the longest computation time found when we did a scheduling interval of two hours and 16 additional hours, uh, you know, still took less than six minutes uh, per schedule. The larger model, okay, this is just the, the quick results on that. Um, the shifting bottleneck was, you know, was run with a scheduler interval of two hours and uh, with no additional horizon. And again, it performed pretty well, though the um, a little bit of a flip here that the BATCS plus ATC, the, the parent tardiness cost uh, was set up rule uh, worked the best. And it had less than 50 seconds if we allowed the automated parameter setting, but was less than 13 seconds if we just said, here's the, here's the standard uh, parameters that you could use so that the, those didn't change by, by instance. So, you know, the conclusion here was that reasonable, uh, if you set reasonable parameters on the shifting bottleneck characteristic, it would clearly outperform the dispatching approaches, okay, in terms of on-time delivery performance as measured by the retardiness. Um, and to generate good schedules, you, you actually should keep the horizon fairly small to account for the uncertainties. And the computation time seems to be small enough that it would uh, allow for application of that approach on a real shop floor. 
Okay, I'm not gonna have time to go through this next set. We actually then looked at uh, trying to do a multi-objective optimization where we considered three different measures. I leave this, I left this in the slides in case you're interested. Uh, we use something called a desirability function to do that, where you would look at each measure and determine how desirable it was from zero to one. And um, then you multiply those together to come up with the overall schedule. And we, we actually ended up getting very good results. And um, we looked at having using the desirability function as both uh, potentially as the subproblem solution procedure and also the machine criticality measure at either a local or global level. All right, and found that using the desirability function was actually quite beneficial. So like I said, I don't really have time to go through that uh, in any detail. Uh, happy to discuss it with you on. There's been several uh, papers since that, that have some relevance here. These are, I've included these just for you to be able to look at uh, over time that have, you know, have, have built off of this. Uh, for instance, the work here by Ray Utsoy and his, his students on looking at uh, reducing the problem by you know, uh, just reducing the graph. That was, I think, interesting work. Um, that's some work on distributed, um, yeah, distributed and uh, you know, uh, distributed computing on that, and looking at you know uh, using multiple computers to solve the subproblem solution procedures in parallel. Uh, there's also a really interesting work here uh, by Stefan and Claude uh, and one of their students at coming up with. Uh, a batch oblivious approach that I think is really quite promising um, because that's one of the things that was the slowest in the work that we did was you had to determine what was the batch size going to be. Uh, so they came up with a, a, a pretty clever approach there. Um, and so a lot of this is actually discussed in a paper that we, that we wrote in 2011. So it's a little old at this point, we're working on updating that. Uh, we're hoping actually that it will also go to the journal scheduling again uh, because there have been some, some advances uh, since then. And as I indicated, uh, I'm back to this to indicate that Lars is gonna come now next week uh, in two weeks and talk about some of the bad scheduling problems, uh, that multiple orders for job scheduling problems that I mentioned, he's gonna go into some detail on that. Uh, and then some work that, that's been done on working at time constraints. And then he'll kind of wrap up and talk about some, some conclusions in future directions. And with that, I will take some questions. Okay, John, thank you very much for a very informative talk. And now please ask the question either in chat or you can ask directly. You can unmute yourself if you have any question of you to say. If this is not the case, uh, then I will ask the first question. So John, please explain. Uh, I didn't really understand how you handle the combination of batching and scheduling together. You are like going through all the possible combinations of batches or maybe it's related to your slide uh, number 25 uh, where you are showing uh, um, the, the three jobs with uh, batches. Huh? Yeah, so the... Um, so you first decide batching and then you run the scheduling algorithm or there are so many possible batches, right? Right, right. And um, so, yeah, we, we made some, uh, a few assumptions there, but we, we did try to consider most of the reasonable possibilities. Um, some you could eliminate fairly quickly by simply looking at, you know, how many jobs are, are gonna be ready um, and, and, and trim that list. Um, you also get to trim the list by the fact that there's only, um, so we put some heuristics in there to, to reduce the, the, you know, the, the, all the batches. We didn't have to consider all the batches. I see. And the heuristic is based on like time window where that particular, uh, product possibly will be ready or. Right. Yep. Mostly based on that. You know, are they within the next time window? Are they, you know, are they even there? And, and uh, 
possible. If they're further out than the, the processing time of, of a batch, then we certainly didn't have to consider them. You only have to consider those because you're making the decision, you know, uh, when to do it. So for the most part, that's all we had to consider. Maybe actually uh, we had to consider a little further than that, but not much. Okay. Thank you. So on yeah. some, some people unmuted themselves, so maybe they want to ask question. Uh, yes, uh, this is not, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm doing something similar. So this is almost the same problem for a fiber manufacturing company. Um, our object is, is a little different that we have to, you know, the goal is just deliver the same demand during the week. So uh, as far as I understand, so you are concerning a couple of, you know, dispatching rules and then develop a simulation model to find out, you know, which one is the best. And then looks like, you know, based on your experience, the shifting bottleneck, uh, which is a very good algorithm for job shop problems, uh, performs the best, correct? That's correct. Yes, so uh, one, you mentioned that you have a constraint that uh, the time interval between processing one item on two you know, consecutive um, you know, stages shouldn't be less than some uh, you know, time intervals, correct? Yeah, that was not, that we didn't have any of those time constraints in in the work that I presented on the shipping. Okay, yeah. So, the, yeah. so since I did, I did have such a problem. So then I, I find that you know the simulation is the only tool to just you know address it. Uh, in in order, if you want to just consider that one, and then your objective is just make sure that you know uh, you have to deliver it because uh, you, as you said that you know some of them you know you they have to pass through the same stages in several times. So it's very complex to just use, you know, such optimization, you know, technique to solve them. So maybe, you know, simulation is the only uh, approach. At least I, I just, I believe that, the, I, do you agree with that? Or just did you have any other, you know, techniques to just address that? Yeah, I, I just think that the, you know, simulation certainly has a role to play in that. And I think, uh, but I think you know combining scheduling techniques into and then using simulations to evaluate makes a lot of sense. And and I you know you can make a case for using some simulation and actually generating the schedule as well. Um, so you know I I think you probably have to pretty much do that case by case. But yes, yes. I just usually we look for scheduling policies rather than scheduling for some certain problems. Is that correct? Usually. Well, I mean, do you consider the shifting bottleneck heuristic of a policy or is it, you know, I think of it as an algorithm instead of a policy, right? It, it's so an algorithm, think, yes, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so if, if we, we assume that okay, they, we use to follow this algorithm, yes, then we are right. Uh, thank you very much, I enjoyed it a lot, thank you. Okay. All let right, ask, so, yeah, okay. go ahead. Okay, let me ask a general question. Um, uh, John, um, uh, shifting bottleneck is basically what you call a decomposition algorithm. And the right. decomposition algorithm is you have an overall problem that has a certain objective function. And with shifting bottleneck, we have seen applications of the make span for the overall objective function, the make span and the total weighted tardiness. And based on the decomposition, there is somewhere a subproblem that you have to formulate. The subproblem, and there is a sequence in which you tackle the set problem and the sequence in which you tackle the, that sequence also there has to be a mechanism designed there. And the, the sub problem has an objective function that is sort of a derivative of the objective function of the main problem. So if it's C max and the main problem, then it's L max in the sub problem and total weighted tardiness, et cetera, et cetera. It has another objective function in the sub problem. Now, let me ask you something. What is a good if you look at the general class, well, first of all, has the shifting bottleneck been applied to other objective functions and the make span and the total weight of tardiness? And the second question is, is there a, what is, uh, it used to be that Ovacik Usoy was the best uh, overview of decomposition methods, but that's a little bit, the book is already 20 years or 25 years old. What is the most recent survey paper on decomposition methods that would include a shifting ball neck? What is the best survey paper? If it's one of yours, please tell me. That, uh, it, it's uh, not one of mine. It's not one of mine for sure. Okay. I, I, uh, 
I have not worked in this area for a while, uh, so I'm not sure I can even really answer your question legitimately. So it's a great question. Um, okay, okay. <laughs> we have to ask it in two weeks to Lars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me ask one question which was in YouTube chat, okay? Okay. So are there examples you encountered where the order of processes applied to the products are allowed to commute, like, and then A, then B, then, and B, then C, then A, both late viable products. Uh, probably that you can, you don't need always to stick to precedence relations, the same understanding from that, right? So are there some, some, some processes in, in wafer fabrication where this happens? Uh, or is the order always fixed? Well, the order of the steps for a given product are always fixed. Very much, very strict recipe, uh, or set of se sequence of steps uh, that, that you have to go through. So there, there is some... no, no parallelism, like it doesn't matter if this is done first and then that is done later. There's no, if you will, openness to this. It's mm -hmm. really, it's really a, a, a job shop. It's really a sequence, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Very, very strict sequences. They, okay. they, they, in semiconductor manufacturing, they want to change nothing, okay, if at all possible, all right? I see. Uh, because the, the, uh, they're particularly those in leading edge factories, they're, they're on the bleeding edge. So, you know, they're constantly looking. If they make a change, it's with a lot of data that they would make a change on something. Mm -hmm. It's very much related probably to the quality, right? Uh, the quality, right. The quality, drive, quality really drives... Uh, drives the process very much. Yeah. It's very strict, yeah? Okay. Yeah. So anybody else wants to have a question or share some view? Don't hesitate to ask uh, or just step in. Uh. And also, I'm, I'm happy if you have a question that you just want to send me an email, uh, john.fowler at asu.edu. you happy to answer questions that way as well. Have a dialogue on this. Okay. So if this, this is not the case, uh, thank you, John. It was great to have you here. And uh, let me remind to others that uh, in two weeks, we will have the second part of this topic, uh, which will be given by Lars Menk uh, from Uni of Hagen. And uh, I hope to meet you here in two weeks. Uh, thank you for being with us and uh, see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Uh, Thanks for having bye -bye. me. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.